Hello, this is Gary Marr of Gwendolyn Community College. This screen capture is from my CIS 150 AB students. In this screen capture, we're going to talk about concepts and the vocabulary around object-oriented programming. Now, this class is called Fundamentals of Object-Oriented Programming. But here we are at Section 7 of the textbook, really first introducing it formally. Now, that's not to say we haven't worked with a little bit already, especially in the chapter we did on modules where we created blocks of code that would take parameters and optionally return information to be reused across multiple applications. I think you probably remember me talking about when we created a function, if we did it in the right way that supported code reuse, there was no reason why we couldn't take that block of code and give it to someone else to use, or maybe use it again ourselves in a different application. You could take in a module something like uh, maybe creating a uh, monthly mortgage payment, create the logic for that, and use that any place where you had to have uh, logic necessary to create a monthly mortgage payment. If this was a bank, a block of code like that could be reused maybe hundreds of times in different applications. Some applications that might run on the internet, some in a PC, some in a mainframe. The basic logic necessary to calculate a monthly mortgage payment would be the same. The more out application, or what environment you try to run it on. So, to build on that, we have object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is all about code reuse. Um, there's never been enough programmers to create all the new programmers programs and fix all the broken programs out there. So many, many moons ago, back probably in the late 80s, some people came up with an idea of um, concepts and techniques that could be used to take existing code and reuse it across multiple applications. Now, having said that, you're going to find that we look at when we look at some of the very first examples of object-oriented programming. You're going to say, "My goodness, we could have done this a lot quicker and a lot easier if we just used the existing uh, techniques and, and logic we've we've learned in class already. Things like you know while loops and if statements. Uh, one of the very first applications we're going to look at." is a class object that um, uh, describes a checkbook where you have deposits, you have checks, and the difference is a balance. That's a very simple calculation that can be done quite easily without object-oriented programming. But this is the benefit. Since there's not enough programmers to create the code, and since so much of the code that we use can be reused, um, a checkbook, for example, if this is a banking application, the calculation of balance could be used thousands of times at a bank. So why not create one version of it? And so therefore, if there's any changes, we only have to change the one version and then just reuse it across multiple applications. That's fundamentally what's behind object-oriented programming. But this is what happens. You're cruising along here. You've got a pretty good handle on logic. You've created some fairly sophisticated programs. And now we come up to class objects, and I'm going to change your world a little bit. Now, we're still going to use if statements. We're still going to use decision structures. We're going to package them inside something called a class. Now, a class is a thing. It's like a blueprint. It's like a cookie cutter. that es essentially explains the structure of something, but missing some of the details. For example, a blueprint of a house has the dimensions of the rooms. It has you know, where the doors are, where the windows are, but it doesn't have uh, the flooring, the color of the walls, what kind of glass in the windows. That's something we're going to add depending on the house we're going to build. That blueprint could be used to build a whole bunch of houses. But what makes our house unique is the details we put behind it. So class objects typically are things, a customer, a purchase, a payment, a vendor. And in that, we're going to describe all of the identifiers that help give that definition. If it's a customer, it would be a name, customer number, address, current balance. And then any methods or modules in this case which would be used by that customer object to calculate things like monthly bill, um, weight fee, um, aging report. This is a little bit difficult to wrap our heads around initially, but as you see with some of the code examples, you're going to find that we're really not introducing anything new in terms of logic. We're just packaging it differently. And we're going to package it in a way so that we can reuse it over and over and over again across multiple programs. Also, because this object is going to be used by multiple applications, we're going to store it in its own file. 
Now, that doesn't happen initially. Some of our first examples I'm going to show you have the class file, or the class definition, I should say, in the same file that holds the application. But typically what's going to happen here is you're going to build logic that's going to take advantage or consume classes. Just like your application now consumes integers, floating point numbers, strings. Again, stay with me. It's a little confusing, but it'll get better as we go. I often like to say that students, when they're learning object-oriented programming, start off with a very dim light bulb. And then hopefully, by the end of this course, it's very bright. You can understand the benefits of objects, how to recognize a programming language does have objects, and then how to implement one. Again, the number one benefit of object-oriented programming is code reusability. One other concept that we've talked a little bit about in class, but not extensively, was abstraction. Now, the idea of abstraction really comes about uh, by a bunch of academicians, hmm, I guess I got that right, who, when they sat down and thought about how the most efficient brain in the world works, and then how to translate that into something that um, you could um, create in a programming language, they thought of the human brain. Okay, That's the most sophisticated computer out there. And if you think about how we use our brain, like a, a computer uses a programming language, it's kind of like this. When you came to school, you got in your car and you drove here, you parked the car, you walked to class. But yet, do you know how your car was built? Could you rebuild the car? Do you know the material that the tires were made out of? Do you know what the wiring diagram looked like for that car's dashboard? No. You simply know that if you gave it some inputs, it would take care of the processing and give you the desired output. So, you know, for example, take the human body. The body takes input, food, processes that food into energy, and then we dispose of that food. Um, system design. So what they really came up with is a design methodology that basically worked around messages. So that when I use somebody else's reusable code, I don't necessarily have to know how it works. I just have to know that if I send it some information that it's expecting to get, it'll process that information and give me an output which I'm expecting to get. How it did it, how it got there, isn't really important to me. Just like how all the pieces of my car work wasn't important to me when I drove to school that morning. And we're going to hit these topics. You take more of an agile approach when you're learning about objects. It's not sequential like it is with um, uh, structured programming, the stuff we've learned up to uh, section six. We're going to talk about some stuff, step back, revisit it, step back, come in again, step back. And it's that cyclical, cyclonic approach to learning that will make objects stick. But you're going to hear a lot of stuff initially that's going to seem very confusing, but hopefully at the end it all comes together. All right here. Foundations. Vocabulary. Classes are things, blueprints, cookie cutters. When I put my cookie cutter in dough, it's just dough, but then I can decorate with sprinkles and hearts and, and all kinds of, and frosting, and that's what makes it unique. Well, a class called customer is just a customer until I give it a name, a customer number, an address, etc. Then it's unique. It's somebody. It's something that I'm going to be using. When classes are created, they're called, they're instantiated, and they're called objects. The vocabulary is important. A blueprint's a class. It doesn't have any properties defined. When I instantiate that, I say, I want that class to become an object. By making an object, I can then change it, and I can give it a name, an address, a customer number, or I can put the sprinkles and hearts on my cookie. Abstraction I just talked about. That's the whole concept of being able to use this code or this class that was created without knowing the details. I'm doing it on trust. Just think about how you use Windows. Do you guys know all of the code that went into Windows? You know all of those, um, uh, what language it was done, and all the routines and all the modules it was created? No. You basically know that Windows is a front-end, a user uh, interface designed around GUI, um, a GUI interface, a graphical design, that when you interact with it, it's going to do things. When you click on a, uh, an icon or when you click on an arrow, you expect the response to you know be according. If it's a pull-down arrow, a list appears. You don't know how that does that. You just know it works that way. That's what abstraction is all about. So when we develop code that's going to be reused and given to somebody else, we only have to tell that person what inputs they have to give us and then what's going to come out the back end. How we do it is not important to them. It's only important to the person who wrote it. Encapsulation 
is a, a technique for reusing code and hiding it from the person who's consuming it, typically a programmer, keeping it safe using gets and set methods. And this is something we'll spend a lot of time in the next uh, section on. Inheritance basically says that some classes can be inherited from other classes. So for example, if I have a student class, that could actually be inheriting from person. In other words, person would have some of the properties, a name and date of birth, and then a student would have additional properties that the person didn't have, like a major, a GPA. Again, inheritance is covered a little bit in this section, but mostly in the next section. So just be patient with it. Some of these terms are going to seem uh, like I'm speaking a different language, but they'll all kind of come around eventually. Uh, you're going to see how working with objects is a lot, a lot how you interact with things around you. Lastly is polymorphism, which means, uh, from the Greek root standpoint, many forms. And that's what this allows us to do is to build modules and methods that are much more flexible and don't require as much logic as we would have had to incorporate if we did this, uh, if we did the same steps or re required the same result with uh, structured programming, which we've learned in the next or previous six um, uh, sections of the textbook. So again, this isn't going to come clear yet. You're still going to be very fuzzy. The light bulb's got a little bit of a blink in it. Stay with it. We're going to get more and more deeper as we go. We'll explain this in terms of graphics. We'll talk about objects in, sort of in, in terms of code. And we'll just talk, talk of um, uh, objects in terms of just discussion. And that way, whatever um, learning uh, best suits you, hopefully you'll be able to pick up one of those, one of those approaches. Um, here's our definition of class objects. Again, blueprint, cookie cutters. There's a, bit, there's a longer explanation there. If you learn better from reading about something, this is a slide for you. Also, the textbook does extensive coverage of this, and I really can't uh, say this enough. Don't be afraid to read that textbook. There's questions that are going to come up in the text that don't come up in these PowerPoints. Here's your abstraction definition and also some examples. Um, key concepts. We've actually talked about this quickly a second ago. Um, class object is a blueprint. When we want to use it in our program, it becomes an object. So, for example, if you think about what we've done so far, we've used numbers and strings in our Python programs since day one. Well, until we actually say we want to use that um, integer and call it total, uh, it's just an integer. It just sits out there as a possibility. When we say we want it to be total, we're actually instantiating it, saying that now we're going to use it in our program. The instantiation process takes it from a class and makes it an object. Each class has members. The members consist of variables and modules, which we've also called functions, but when a module is owned by a class member, it's called a method. And again, they're all three the same. Modules, functions, and methods are all the same. The only thing that makes them different is about where they exist. A module is for pseudocode. A function is for most programming languages when it's not part of a class. But if a function is part of a class, it becomes a method. And that's a vocabulary thing. And you're going to find that's going to be true of any programming language you take at GCC. When they talk about methods, it means that that function is owned by a class and therefore has to be called differently. Dot notation. This is where it gets called differently. If I instantiate a class called customer and in it it has a variable called customer name or if in it it has a method called um, customer label then the way I would call that out is to use the instantiated name I gave it, a dot and then either the property that defines the data or a method that, that defines some sort of function or routine I want it to do. That dot notation is critical. If you see something with a dot in it, it's a class object. And if you think back into some of the things I did in Python, there have been many times where I used class objects but didn't explain it to you because it was too early in the game. But they're out there all the time. In fact, most new languages use class objects extensively. Encapsulation. This one's going to be a tough one to get to right away, but essentially what encapsulation does is it basically hides the details from us. And this is important where you're using somebody else's code. I mean, again, we all use Windows, but could we create Windows from scratch ourselves? No way. Could we modify Windows? Probably not. But yet we use it all the time. So that's more or less what happens 
with encapsulation, and also this is uh, the concept that supports encapsulation is abstraction. Uh, inheritance. Again, this is when a class that you're going to create can inherit some of the members from another class. So if I have a class called GCC student, it may inherit from student, and then student might inherit from person. Person would have name, date of birth. Student would have major and um, maybe GPA. And GCC student would have county of residence because uh, at GCC you get a discount or you pay one rate if you're a resident of Maricopa and a different rate if you're not. Polymorphism is a little tough right now. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward, but it's hard to explain it unless I show you in code. There's two thing, two concepts in um, polymorphism you're going to be responsible for. One's called overloading. One's called overriding. Overloading is when we create uh, multiple methods with the same name, but different parameters. Uh, the method has, you know, obviously a function for the keyword, a name, then it has input parameters. Sometimes the input parameters could be different. For example, if I'm doing area of a square, I could have two integers, two floats, an integer float, and a float integer. All those numbers would give me the area of a square. So what I'll do is I create one method called square, but I create it with four different parameter lists. One for two integers, two floats, etc. Overriding is a little bit different. Overriding is during the inheritance process. Maybe I'm going to inherit a method from my parent. Maybe it's called GPA. Well, the parent's GPA says anybody's got a GPA over, I shouldn't say GPA, I should say Dean's List. Anybody that has a Dean's List over 3.5 in my parent's uh, class would get Dean's List. But let's say GCC has higher standards. There's a 3.6. What I could do is I could take the name of that method and give it new logic and say, okay, for my instantiated version of this GCC student, I don't want to use my parent's method. I'm going to use one of my own design. This is probably, again, easier to show you the code than it is to wrap your head around just from um, the words in this uh, bulleted list. Um, okay, here we go. Pseudocode, start, and end. Okay, uh, I guess I'd probably make one. I'm sorry. Um, there should be one more end down here. This is a class file. This is the program. The program says, I'm going to create a variable it's called CB. It's going to be of type checkbook. What's type checkbook? Checkbook's a class. It has one, two properties, one method, two methods. So CB now, if I use dot notation, will let me change the deposits. That was one of the variables. It'll let me, it'll let me um, modify it again by simply saying deposits, 100 plus deposits, so if I had $100 in there, 100 plus 100 is what, 200? Here I'm changing the value of checks to be 100. And there was another um, uh, method here called current balance. I'm going to go to the top of it. Current balance is a method that owned by checkbook that somebody gives me the balance. So it takes the deposits minus the checks, which are owned by the class, and simply print, it does a calculation, and then simply prints out to the screen deposits, what the deposit amount is, checks, what the check amount is, and balance what the bound amount says. None of this code here is really different than what we've looked at in the past. It's just packaged differently. The idea here is, is this class file, I could pick up and use this in any program that needs to calculate checkbook balance. It's a very simple example. So, you know, you're probably saying to yourself, well, geez, why don't you just create it from scratch and leave it in there? Well, this one probably could be done that way. You didn't even have to use classes. Could I not take all this logic and put it over here under my pseudocode and be done with it? Yeah but then I don't have a reusable class anymore. Um, instantiation is when we take a class um, that we've already created and we say we want it to be a variable, CB, like in the last example. Dot notation lets us call out the data members, which are called properties, and also lets us call out the methods, okay, with dot notation. So it would be the uh, object name dot and then print label which would be a method owned by that class. Um, parts of a class. The properties can be um, separated into instance variables and class variables. Or I see instant members and class members. I just realized it, I split them up. The instance members <coughs> are like the, uh, the paint in the walls, the flooring and the ceiling. 
The variables define what the class can look like. The methods that are owned by that class provide the actions that come with a class. A class variable is one that's shared with all classes of that type. So for example, if I had a class for employee one, a class for employee two, a class for employee three, they would each have their own set of instance members, but they would share class for a class variable. So it's kind of like a super global lets me keep track or lets me accumulate in that property that's a class variable information and calculations and all that good stuff from all of the members uh, or all the class members that have that same um, parent, that same class, if you will. <coughs> this again, <coughs> excuse me, this again will probably be easier to show you in code. And again, a lot of this stuff, you know, I know what it's like because I've taught this for so long. This first chapter is a little tough to swallow. But we're going to revisit these concepts over and over and over again as we get you through um, object oriented programming. Um, this is pretty much very similar to what I just talked about. This is actually a blow by blow description of what happens. I just spoke to that a minute ago, so I'm going to leave that as is. And this is the questions part. Now, there's going to be a lot of questions. And again, when I meet with you guys in our um, uh, virtual classroom. I'll go through a lot more of these examples. There's a lot of examples that uh, I've got out there that you can look at. We start off with some simple examples, some of which a little oversimplified just to make sure that primary concepts are understood. And then we get a little fancier when it comes to the uh, next section. And then the last two sections on events, um, exception handling and GUIs, will drive home the point that learning how to create logic with objects is very important in terms of creating the kinds of applications most people want these days, which are GUI applications of high quality and are very uh, responsive and um, easy to maintain, uh, the kind of thing that also an employer would like to see. I can't imagine trying to go into uh, an interview these days uh, as a programmer or a program designer and not having at least a fairly general knowledge of how objects work. It's that important to uh, program design in the programming industry. All right, guys, um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I will see you online.